Excellent. Okay. Good morning, everybody. We're going to talk today about um, cartilage tumors. This is a continuation of um, <clears throat> MSK talking about bone tumors this month. Hopefully, people have noticed that there's been like a trend in talks. Uh, good thumbs up there from one person who's here. Um, and uh, we, we'll try to figure out over time if that's helpful to uh, do it in batches. It's hard for you all to come to all the talks, I know. But um, um, so cartilage tumors are definitely worth knowing something about because they're fairly common in everyday practice. And uh, we end up trying to differentiate benign from malignant lesions commonly, and, um, and it can be challenging. So what I hope to do is give you a framework for the different types of cartilage tumors that you may encounter um, and, and a couple that you may not really encounter, but it's worth hearing about. And so there's really five types of lesions that we'll talk about today uh, listed here. The combination of bone and cartilage, osteochondroma, then enchondroma and chondrosarcoma. That's kind of the core of what becomes a dilemma in, uh, in imaging. And the less common lesions of chondroblastoma and chondromyxoid fibroma. <clears throat> so osteochondroma is um, also known as an exostosis, osteocartilaginous exostosis. And Usually they're solitary, there's just one of them, but there are syndromes where you can have multiple hereditary exostoses. They tend to grow from a cartilage cap, and the important thing to know is that just like our skeletons uh, overall, they stop growing at skeletal maturity. So, so the problems that people get into with these being malignant tend to be when they're younger rather than they're older, um, but it can't... The, the malignancy can occur at, at later ages as well. There's different shapes, and I'll show examples of pedunculated versus sessile. And then the, the old boards thing used to say, if the cartilage cap on these is less than one centimeter, not to worry, and greater than one centimeter, you have to worry more about uh, malignant transformation. So here's an example uh, that is from our clinical material here not too long ago. and. In this lateral view of the femur, uh, the bone should just be straight along here, but there's this large bony protuberance anteriorly. You see it on here on the frontal view. Sometimes the frontal view is a little bit confusing, right, because it's superimposing. So the, the lateral view really helps us. And the key thing is that you see it's this lesion is pretty much contiguous with the underlying bone. It's really it's hard to distinguish a boundary between the actual lesion itself and the uh, parent femur here. So that's a big kind of sessile osteochondroma. So these are often incidental, uh, often painless. They can grow over time, occur in long bones, femur, tibia humerus. Um, they can occur in, in many different locations as listed here. Um, and again, as I said, they're continuous with the underlying bone. Usually if they're like around the knee, for example, you'll notice that they point away from the joint and they kind of arise in the region of the growth plate. And so then as things grow, they tend to grow away from the joint. MR is good for looking at cartilage cap and soft tissue involvement, uh, which can be complications of these things. So here's an example in the scapula. Now, if you just had a chest radiograph, you might confuse this for a pulmonary mass or some other chest wall mass, but on the scapular views, you can see it's a it's a exophytic lobulated mass arising from the tip of the scapula and kind of varying in density, but pretty well defined. And this is a pretty good look for a chondroid type lesion. And some of them have a lot of bone on them, and some of them have more of this chondroid kind of end to it. It doesn't mean that this is entirely the cartilaginous cap part of it. Um, so you can have kind of different degrees of maturity of bone and, and cartilage in these. And then non, usually it's the non-calcified cartilage that's the part that people are worrying about as being potentially transforming to malignancy. <clears throat> Here's another example from the tibia, right? So you see this well-defined bony protuberance here postromedially, and then it has this lobulated kind of cap on it here. Now, again, like I said, you might have a little layer of non-calcified cartilage along here. Um, this whole thing usually doesn't qualify as like the, quote, cartilage cap per se. 
So it, lesions like this, they tend to still be benign, highly likely to be benign, but they can cause mechanical problems. And in this patient, we had an MRI because he was having knee pain, and you can see a few things. One is on the T2 weighted scan, you see a lot of fluid around the end of this lesion and see a little bit of signal within the lesion itself. This is that lobulated part, maybe a little bit of bone marrow edema here. Um, on the T1 weighted scan, you can see that there is that continuity between the marrow fat and the lesion. And basically what this is, though, is this is mechanical effect of forming like a, a bursa around this lesion from just kind of chronic friction. And so indications like this, it doesn't mean it's malignant. Um, you know, it's not invasive. It can be a little bit tricky to know for sure whether this is aggressive behavior or not, but there's no bony breakthrough and and so on. So a lot of times if these are causing mechanical effects, they just get resected um, <clears throat> at the base and uh, removed without any further problems. Um, so bursa formation is one thing. This is another example where there's a complication, but it's a vascular complication. This is a kind of an old case that I got from Ken Buckwalter at Indiana. And see, this is a good example of an osteochondroma, very sessile, broad-based thing arising from the posterior femur. This patient may actually have multiple hereditary because you can see a little one off the uh, fibula here. This one we don't know about. That's probably just the tibial tuberosity at a younger patient. But looking at the MRI, you can see that the continuity with the medullary space is there. And it's this broad-based bony prominence from the posterior femur. And it's, it's impinging on the, the femoral vessels as they come down uh, the, the posterior medial thigh here. So this, this was a young patient who presented with like claudication type symptoms because of this mechanical effect on the superficial femoral artery. <clears throat> so once again, um, bursa formation, vascular compromise, nerve impingement, local pain are some of the complications you can get from these osteochondromas. So the solitary ones are often just um, <clears throat> uh, just incidental and uh, don't necessarily have any um, family predilection. You can have them because of prior trauma. Um, there can be some family connection, but it's not like a strong dominance. Um, and these probably don't have much of an increased risk of malignancy, these solitary osteochondromas, but they usually get looked at, uh, followed over time. It's to be differentiated from the, the hereditary disorder that's autosomal dominant, which has now been associated with some, some genetic, um, <clears throat> Uh, some gene uh, products or, or, or genetic, uh, you know, genes that are associated with the disorder. And these are the patients that are thought to have a higher risk of malignant degeneration of the osteochondromas. Um, the more central lesions like pelvis, scapula, humerus, knee, tend to be more likely to be malignant. So here's, here's an example of um, multiple hereditary Again, and it's similar to the ones that I showed, a very broad-based lesion on the anterior femur distally. Then another, this is all a really broad-based kind of lesion here. This part's kind of pedunculated, but a couple of lesions. And notice again the way that points away from the joint. I would say of all the patients that we see uh, with this multiple hereditary exostosis, you know, it's really rare for us to actually see cases of malignancy. So it probably is on the order of that 1%. Um, so it's not a trivial amount, but it's, uh, but it's quite uncommon. The, the kind of non-malignant uh, complications are much more common than the aggressive malignant complications. This is one that was bad, though. And so here's an AP pelvis on a young man, I think he was in his early 20s, and, and he has hereditary exostoses. It, it's manifest mainly by these big, broad-based, sessile osteochondromas along the femoral necks here. And the problem he has is this big, fluffy mass lesion around the right SI joint, which shows up better on the, the lateral view. And you see it's big exophytic uh, mass lesion. And you can see it's got that kind of chondroid matrix to it. So whenever anything gets this big, ill-defined and extending outside the bone, you definitely have to worry about a malignancy. And so, and this was, in fact, uh, a, a chondrosarcoma. So this is a one of these patients with multiple hereditary 
excess doses that had malignant degeneration of one that presumably arose in the region of the right ilium or, or sacrum here. Um, so we're, some of these things kind of cross boundaries, right? I showed the exostosis osteochondroma. Now I'm going to talk a little bit more about enchondromas, and we'll come back to chondrosarcomas. So enchondromas we see all the time, right? Coming across the bone board as incidental things, um, and they're usually not uh, very problematic. Uh, you can see the numbers like up to 17% of primary bone tumors. They're very common not real common in the hand itself, but if you have a focal lesion in the hand, this is the most likely suspect is an enchondroma, that and probably bone cyst and um, other things. So they can be solitary or multiple, usually solitary, usually detected around third and fourth decade. Uh, if you have multiple of these, that can be Olier's disease, multiple enchondromatosis. And if you have multiple with hemangiomas, that's Mapuche syndrome, you can kind of Things that you probably need to know for radiology, but do they come in handy in the reading room? You know, not too often, to be honest. Here's another case that I had just from um, Ken Buckwalter, which is kind of a classic appearance of an enchondroma. So humeral metaphysis, pretty well-defined, lobulated borders. Um, in this case, there's no scalloping of the endosteum of the bone, no soft tissue mass. and it can get pretty dense as far as the calcification goes. We'll look at a couple others in a minute here. So um, a fair number of these are in long bones like femur. Humerus seems to be a quite a common spot. So femur, humerus, um, the bigger bones to somewhat in the hand. Um, you can see all the different demographics here. Tend to be probably metaphyseal, but they can be in the diaphysis. Um, they can be, I would say, tending to be mixed type lesions with sclerosis as well as some lucency, um, fairly well defined. The key thing about enchondromas is in the periphery, they're almost always calcified. And whether, whether you see calcification on the radiograph, uh, you know, may not be quite as sensitive, but if you do CT scan, you're almost always going to see that mineralization. So sometimes if there's a question and you have to really know, is there calcium deposited in this thing? CT can be helpful. And so the lower grade lesions like enchondroma is a benign cartilaginous lesion. They tend to not show aggressive features. So the cortex is generally spared. You may have a little bit of scalloping, but one of the key distinguishing things probably between enchondroma and low grade chondrosarcoma is this cortical scalloping. And in enchondromas, it should be less than two thirds of the thickness of the, of the cortex. So here's two different patients with enchondromas again, you know, kind of flocculent densities in the metaphysis in these patients, little rounded areas. A lot of times people say C's and O's. I can never quite see that myself, but the, that type of pattern, popcorn calcification, sometimes people say. Um, when you look at the endosteal cortical border here, there's no scalloping here, right? Because these are pretty much centered up in the medullary cavity. So those are compatible with enchondroma, like, or sometimes we'll say low-grade chondroid lesion, um, and uh, pretty typical. We just see them incidentally and, uh, and, and usually don't need to do anything further unless there's pain associated with it. Um, on MR imaging, they're, they're pretty well delineated and in this example, there's a, so it's a T1 weighted sagittal image of the tibia and a fat suppressed T2 weighted image. And you can see that lobulated border that is typical of a chondroid lesion. And the chondroid lesions tend to have quite bright signal on T2 weighted images. The, um, the actual cartilage in here is much more T2 bright than like hyaline cartilage along the joint surfaces. So don't be surprised by seeing right signal, it's nearly gets to be fluid signal intensity. Uh, if you have mineralization within that, like this just has a little small dot of dark signal here, here, that could be some of that more, more calcified material. So the MR is helpful for delineating the extent of these things. And it doesn't necessarily show you whether they're calcified or not very well. So you need the radiographs to correlate. Um, 
but MR is used for like determining the extent in the case of uh, surgical planning, also to look for things like soft tissue mass. And with MR, like here's that same lesion in the left tibia, here it is on the T2. And if you look at the cortex here, you can often get a sense of how much scalloping there is in the cortex, or you can get a sense of is there actually mass extending outside the bone, which this patient does not have. So in this example, this looks to me like pretty benign appearance of the of the enchondroma or the chondroid lesion. <clears throat> There's a, a paper that came out recently that talks about the MR appearance of these and whether there's some specificity be, to be had by the idea that the benign lesions tend to have areas where they're kind of lobules of cartilage, but there's fat interspersed in between them, kind of these speckles of, of calcification. This one doesn't really have it, or speckles of cartilage. Um, but there may be something to that in the MR helping to help uh, differentiate benign versus malignant. But, but it's mainly the aggressive things we look for are like periosteal reaction, soft tissue mass, deep cortical scalloping from the endosteal side, and then correlating that with what uh, clinical features the patient has. So this is an example of one in the finger. And a lot of times these can get a little bit confusing looking because they make the patient at risk for fracture. So you may see sequelae of fracture as well. But See, this one is kind of more of a ground glass type matrix. Maybe there's a fracture through here, but there's not really much obvious calcification within this lesion. But statistically, something like this is likely to be uh, an enchondroma. Main differential diagnosis for something like this is usually like a cyst because without calcification, you can't tell if that has fluid in it or if it's solid material. What, uh, what entity do you think we might be looking at here in this patient that has like multiple of these? Yeah, so this is good for Olier's um, syndrome, and this is a really beautiful image of a young child that has extensive enchondromas throughout pretty much all the visualized metacarpals and phalanges from Dr. Jones's collection um, in uh, the bone tumor collection. Um, we're not going to get into it much, but it's good to know that these cartilage lesions uh, you know, usually occur in bone, but you can have juxtacortical lesions as well, like juxtacortical chondromatous lesions, sometimes lesions that go are inside the bone and protrude out. Like this is a focal lesion that's protruding outside the distal phalanx here. See it here. And those can be um, cartilaginous lesions like benign chondromas. And sometimes you can have soft tissue chondrosarcomas as well. So the cartilage can form in uh, many different areas. So what about the differential diagnosis? The key thing, as I said, is enchondroma versus low-grade chondrosarcoma. And it's important to remember that the, um, the pathologists can't tell the difference themselves. They get tissue back from one of these lesions that's biopsied, and the, the histology is identical between an enchondroma and a low-grade chondrosarcoma. It's kind of bland appearing cartilage, a lot of matrix, not a lot of mitotic figures. So they really rely on the imaging to determine whether this is an aggressive lesion or a non-aggressive lesion. And that's where we come in as radiologists quite, quite frequently. So that's the, the main differential for enchondroma, and that's uh, the main kind of diagnostic dilemma that comes up. People talk about infarcts, and I'll show examples of that, and then I can mention the bone cyst question in a digit. So here's an example. So I just put up, okay, low-grade chondroid lesion. You can look at this, and it's like, okay, it's in the humerus. It's an adult. It's got this kind of ovoid and irregular densities in it that are kind of scattered about. It's not like one big zone of mineralization. Maybe there's some loosened areas around here. So this looks good for a chondroid lesion to me. And um, not much scalloping here. In the, in the endosteal surfaces, no obvious soft tissue mass. MRI here shows that's pretty extensive lesion. This is some of that business where maybe there's some islands of marrow here that are still uh, got fat in it that, that tend towards maybe suggesting this is a more benign lesion. You don't see any soft tissue mass or periosteal reaction. You can see some of the low signal foci in here are the calcifications that you see on the radiography. 
And one, one of the things to look at when you uh, review a case like this is to say, well, how much calcification do we actually see radiographically? And does that correlate well with the overall extent of the lesion? Because what, what can be um, tricky is that the calcification may be over a certain extent, but the non-calcified part may extend way down. And if that's the case, then you have to worry more because um, that non-calcified part could be more aggressive. And so in this example, it's a little bit hard to reconcile the whole thing, but you can see the low signal foci in here are calcification, and then there's some non-calcified part here. So um, it's hard to totally reconcile this one, but just keep that, that concept in mind. <clears throat> so um, Dr. Moeller, uh, gave me these slides a, a few years ago. He's the orthopedic oncologist, and he he says, "What do they use clinically to help distinguish these um, lesions?" So, if you're thinking enchondroma compared to low-grade chondrosarcoma, usually no pain picked up incidentally, less than two centimeters, no scalloping, and if you're lucky, the bone scan is negative. Now, the problem is about 80% of bone scans are going to be positive, so it's a small fraction that are actually negative. If, um, if you have a lesion like this that you think is just an incidental enchondroma, they can uh, confirm it in six to 12 months with a follow-up plain radiograph or sometimes MRI, okay? So then, then the other end of the spectrum is chondrosarcoma. It can be a longer lesion, like this one is longer in the humerus here, long, definitely longer than two centimeters. Um, they tend to be associated with pain at night now, around the shoulder, it's particularly hard because you could have bursitis or other things that create pain, so it can be tricky to know what's, uh, what's the pain generator. But, but pain is a feature. Um, bone scans are positive. They tend to grow over time, and you may see endosteal scalloping. Now, this one is hard a little bit to see there, but those are features that trend towards chondrosarcoma. And so this is the other differential that's often thrown out, and these are infarcts. So a little bit similar. The main difference between infarcts is they tend to have like a rim of sclerosis around it, demarcating a lesion, like here in the tibia. There's one in the femur here, and then one in this tibia here. Without that central flocculent calcification, like you can see a little bit of that here. So I find usually you can tell that something's not an infarct and it's much more likely to be a chondroid type lesions, but these are the things that are classically thrown out for a differential diagnosis. <clears throat> so if we move from like the benign end of the spectrum towards the more aggressive, we'll, you know, look at chondrosarcomas. And um, these are common, um, third most common primary malignant bone tumor. So in, in older patients, especially um, they're going to be more common than things like osteosarcoma or Ewing's just because those don't occur in the old folks as much. So um, older patients, mean of 48 years, very rare in younger uh, patients. And again, as I said, the key distinction is between the uh, pathology and the radiography. <clears throat> so these are lytic lesions. They may not have much as much calcification that's obvious as the at enchondromas, especially as they get aggressive, but they can show things like cortical break and periostitis. And as I mentioned, they might actually arise in extraskeletal uh, or juxtaskeletal soft tissues. So this is kind of the picture to have in mind for a chondrosarcoma. This is again from Dr. Jones's collection. Don't say that's from my residency in 1952. Um, but a pelvic chondrosarcoma, so destroying part of the innominate bone here, these big kind of exophytic densities, some loosened areas, some sclerotic areas. That's kind of an ant mini for um, a chondrosarcoma. It looks similar to that one that I showed in the, the right SI joint region. Another look that you might see is something like this, and it may be a little bit hard to project, but in this patient, see a little bit of periosteal reaction along the distal femur here and here, a little bit here. And the underlying bone, it's a little bit of calcification in here, but it has some lucency here. And this is not that uncommon of appearance where you, you may have had an enchondroma sitting in there, and then there's some malignant transformation that, that went on, and then there's a more aggressive non-calcified part here that's starting to affect the cortex and leading this periosteal reaction. So 
again, a kind of ill-defined lesion like this, you want to be thinking about a chondrosarcoma in an older patient. Um, these images are not real pretty, but it's another uh, example of a chondrosarcoma where it's got a big kind of exophytic or I should say expansile lesion, but with fairly well-defined borders here in the humerus, big soft tissue mass on MRI, and on the CT scan, you can see it's penetrating through the cortex and you see these punctate areas of density in there going along with the mineralization that you'd expect for a chondrosarcoma. So for the high-grade lesions, it's usually not a real dilemma. It's the lower-grade ones like enchondroma versus low-grade chondrosarcoma that we, we struggle with the radiography. If, if you have a high-grade lesion, it's like, oh, that looks aggressive, like this thing extending through the bone, inside and outside the bone, extensive on MRI. Uh, lung mets are common. Unfortunately, they don't, they don't respond well to either chemotherapy or radiation therapy, and so patients can end up getting these radical surgical excisions and attempts at limb salvage, but the outcomes are really not very good if you have a high-grade chondrosarcoma. One uh, last point about chondrosarcoma is that there is a rare variety of it that's worth just hearing about once, which is this one called a clear cell chondrosarcoma. And it, it can look kind of uh, fairly innocent. This is the example here in this left femoral head region where there's some lucency, there's a little bit of sclerosis. Um, you might take this for, you know, an area of fibrous dysplasia or geode or um, possibly a giant cell, although it's a little bit sclerotic for that. This was like a 20-something-year-old patient. So if you've never heard of this entity of a clear cell chondrosarcoma, you probably wouldn't even, even think about it. Um, but that's what this turned out to be. Um, the good news is these tend to be more indolent lesions. They're not as aggressive as like a high-grade malignant chondrosarcoma, and uh, the patients tend to do better from these than, than from the uh, high-grade chondrosarcs. Um, the last two lesions I'll just touch on for a moment here because they're not that common. Um, chondroblastoma, we, we do talk about. We see it occasionally, but they are quite rare lesions. So the, the thing about this is they're, they're more likely in kids. So under, under 30, like all you guys, um, male to female, a little bit higher in males. Does that help you or not? Yeah, hard to know because it's not that big of a ratio. These are a little bit, think of a little bit like osteoid osteomas in that they can cause a lot of pain and swelling and, and adjacent synovitis. So they can be really symptomatic. Uh, the crucial thing differential is epiphyseal or apophyseal uh, in location. So <clears throat> lytic, well-marginated, uh, well-defined lesion, may or may not have a, a sclerotic rim to it, um, sometimes calcified. And the MR can be kind of confusing because it might show more, more of the reactive change than the actual lesion itself. So take a look at this example here. It's a little bit burned out, but there's um, a young adult, nice looking bones otherwise, lucent lesion in this uh, greater trochanter of the femur. So that's an apophysis. And you might have a differential for something like this. It's a focal lucent lesion. It could be something potentially like um, infection, possibly a giant cell, um, you know, going towards the apophysis. Um, another bone cyst would be fairly common. But think about chondroblastoma if it's involving an apophysis. And then on the MR in this patient, you can see it's a young woman, um, well-defined fluid signal uh, in that area or close to fluid signal. It might actually be solid tissue in there. It's hard to know without the window in this, but, but a lot of surrounding edema in that intertrochanteric region. So here's the, here's the lesion here and here, and a lot of surrounding reactive change in this example that was a uh, chondroblastoma. <clears throat> I think that's the only one I've seen live. This is another one from the uh, Ken Buckwalter where it's got a lucent epiphyseal lesion here, the classic differential of an epiphyseal lesion in a young patient, and here it is on T1-weighted MRI, well-defined lesion chondroblastoma. <clears throat> Now, this is the one, the chondromyxoid fibroma CMF. If you read Helm's bone tumor book, he says, don't waste any brain cells on this lesion. And uh, that's probably not bad advice. Um, 
I would say that you know we we get asked to look at all these these tumor cases for pathology, and they bring down the radiographs and the and they talk about the histology with us. And this is a lesion I've been burned on many times because I didn't I either didn't reserve a brain cell for this one in training, or else I <clears throat> I destroyed that brain cell in some tailgating event or something like that. Um, so I'm trying to learn it back, you know, learn it the chondromyxoid fibroma, because they're really rare. Um, and the ones I've seen are in the tibia, it turns out. So uh, l quite uncommon, younger patients, things like tibia, femur, uh, medullary and eccentric. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that are kind of soft things. Could be diaphyseal, could be metaphyseal. Um, the thing I've seen is this lobular type lesion with sclerotic borders. They tend to look fairly benign in their appearance, and they look kind of strange when I show you the picture of it here. So it might catch your attention. But you can have a differential that could be something cystic, chondroid, non ossifying fibroma, or fibrous dysplasia, or adamantinoma, and all the things you can think of that could occur in the tibia and just really not know. <clears throat> so this is the this is the picture that I keep on that one half a brain cell that I have left from this one um, of this really kind of ugly looking lesion. You know, it looks like really bad acne or something to me, where it's just you know eating away pieces of the bone here, um, loosen areas, fairly well defined uh, mid diaphysis in the tibia here, and and you sort of look at it, it's like, well, that doesn't look like really anything I've ever seen before. And so that's when I'm triggered to think, well, what about that chondromyxoid fibroma that I, I don't want to get burned on uh, again? So that's a, a, the one example of that <clears throat> that I have. So um, I can take some questions here in a moment, but I uh, just wanted to give you a, a quick tour of these different uh, cartilage lesions that you will see, um, osteochondroma or exostosis the enchondroma versus chondrosarcoma, low grade kind of dilemma. You see the higher grade chondrosarcs and then um, the less common things like chondroblastoma and CMF. Um, so that's kind of the end of my uh, didactic part here and then I'll uh, cut off and I can uh, take some uh, questions.